Good morning as we go deeper into Lent. It's worth reminding ourselves that the things we're talking about in the church today in Rome aren't anything new, really, unfortunately. This is a story that I've had this article for a few days now, and but it's part of a larger story that's gone back at least to 2019 and 2018 when the Ted McCarrick problem really began to take focus. Ted McCarrick is related to Vatican finances in at least one very obvious way. He was core to the Papal Foundation. This is a fundraising mechanism where typically wealthy donors, wealthy Catholics, would be approached to give donations to support the work of the Office of the Papacy, the mission of the Holy Father, as they would say, evangelization and the rest of it. And we're talking big money donors hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars, that kind of thing. He That's was what Ted McCarrick was known for. And the consequence of his involvement in this and of all the things Ted McCarrick himself did is that we know now that many Catholics stopped giving money to the, to the Vatican. The refrain of not one more penny is a common refrain to the point where many people don't want to donate to their parish. And for you know, the reason is pretty straightforward why people, if you don't understand why people might not want to donate to their parish and instead seek to do their, their tithing to support the work of the church in other ways, it's pretty simple why they would go to this length. People take their money. They put it in that collection basket. The collection basket is then count. The money's all counted. All the masses for the day are counted. And at the end of the month, the parish has to pay a diocesan tax or a diocesan tithe where the parish has to give a certain percentage of the amount they collected to the diocese. And it's based on the head count of your parish. So when you don't give money to your parish and if your parish falls short of actually give of the amount they're supposed to give the diocese, they take the money anyway from other sources from other ways it can create problems. It's one of those issues that there isn't a, a neat answer to, should you give to your parish or not? But the money that the diocese collects through its own fundraising and it's, it's that tithe system and other ways they have of getting money, they themselves have to send some money to the Vatican, a small percentage. And so you can get all the thousands of dioceses around the world sending money to the Vatican, and that's where you end up. So the result here is that Catholics are giving less money in general, to their parish, which sends less money to the diocese, and responding less generously to diocesan appeals. This is not just the state of the economy influencing this. This is Catholics are fed up. And as you can imagine, the two biggest countries for donations to the Vatican are the United States and Germany. Other countries give generously too. I don't mean to exclude any of you from other countries watching this. But the two of the wealthiest countries in the world give the most to the church. That's not that surprising. Of course, there's other ways that the, the uh, dioceses get money too. We should definitely not discount the influence of uh, federal contracting for things like um, the various social causes that the government wants to throw money at. They'll recruit nonprofit organizations, including religious organizations like dioceses and Catholic charities and things like that to do that same work. And oftentimes dioceses do get a small cut of that money too. And so you see this stuff happening and money ends up in Rome. Well, that in Rome, they're getting less of that money now. And it's such a problem that, they, that they're having to start doing, being inventive with how to make up their budget shortfalls and but they haven't got a plan to fix the problem because the core of the problem is Catholics are fed up with a lot of the politics coming out of Rome and they're fed up with the Ted McCarrick stuff. They're fed up with the modernism and the overt heresies coming from Rome Catholic and from their dioceses and even in some cases their parish priests. Catholics are fed up and are not willing to support it anymore. So here we will go and take a look at the main story and then I'm going to give you some actual like uh, supporting articles on this. So the pillar who I will remind people does moderate as best they can, just straight journalism without commentary. But sometimes you see not that they're biased, but sometimes they report on things that are just so out there that they can't help, but do a bit of a fact check on some of the things that are being said by the people they've, uh, they're quoting. So, but the pillar does good work 
And I was honestly skeptical when the pillar launched at first, but I'm very happy to eat crow on that one. They do very good work there. So the headline from a couple weeks ago is, what if the Vatican actually goes broke? What indeed would happen if the Vatican goes broke? It does cost money to maintain those museums and those cathedrals and things and the other the basilicas and all the other properties in Vatican City. It does take money to maintain those things. And yes, Catholics do have a duty to support basic, the basic upkeep of property in the church, as well as to you know support the hierarchy of the church. But the problem is the hierarchy of the church, people dispute that if they're even Catholic anymore. So you see, begin to see where the problem lies. Let's go to the article. Quote, the Holy See is by its own accounting in serious financial straits. While some curial asset managers have begun to show modest to modest returns in recent years, donations remain down and the Vatican is still operating with a runaway budget deficit. Meaning they're the curial asset managers. We're talking here people who invest the money in the Vatican into like stock systems and things. They're getting some modest returns, responsible returns on investment, but it's not enough to make up this uh, runaway budget deficit. So how bad is the financial weather over Rome? And what, if anything, is being done to turn things around? And what happens if the Vatican actually goes broke? Is that even possible? According to some people who spent years working in Vatican finances, those are questions that need to start being asked sooner rather than later. The factors weighing in on the Vatican finances are well known to most observers. Years of financial scandals and diminished uh, worldwide offerings have left the Holy See struggling to balance its books for many years. You remember when it, it came out that the Vatican was uh, investing money in some weird real estate speculation in London for condos for the for like like for the super rich kind of flies in the face of Francis's messages and just basic Catholic messaging about the use of Catholic funds. Right. Um, how about the uh, that uh, Elton John biopic? Yes, the Vatican finance part of that movie. It's an odd look coming from the Vatican until you remember that there are probably a lot more James Martin types in the hierarchy than we care to admit. Let's continue. Added to this have been acute shocks to its financial system, most notably the 2020 affliction, which essentially shuttered Vatican City to visitors for a year, choking off revenue from museums and shops to say nothing of votive offerings in major churches like St. Peter's Basilica. In May 2020, the Secretariat for the Economy predicted a, tw a 2021 drop in Vatican income of anywhere between 30% and 80% because of those events, even after a 21% drop in 2020. Remember, a lot of people couldn't move around freely at the time. So international, the international tourism, Vatican City had lost almost all of it with, uh, with catastrophic consequences. Less than a year later, the Secretariat announced a 49.7 million euro shortfall for the Vatican's annual budget for 2021, the lowest possible revenue drop, 30% within its predicted band. But the deficit was actually closer to 80 million. The Secretariat's statement noted once money from Peter's Pence and other restricted funds was factored out. Yes, they were using money from Peter's Pence to help make up for the budget shortfall. I guess the supporting the mission of the Holy Father in this case probably can be expanded to include keeping the lights on at Vatican City. But by 2022, the Vatican's financial secretariat was painting a far rosier picture. The then prefect Juan Antonio Guerrero Alves, SJ, Jesuit, touted a new budgetary and accounting process, taking into account a far broader swath of curial institutions and claimed a better than expected operating deficit of 77 million euros. Things were, Guerrero said, headed in the right direction. Until suddenly they weren't. Later that year, Guerrero resigned, citing health reasons, and was replaced by his departmental number two, the layman Maximino Caballero Leto. By 2023, Leto was clearly less bullish than his former boss had been. While the Secretariat did not publish its budget for the year, as it had done in 2021 and 2022, the mood music coming from the department has been bleak. Early in 2023, Francis announced that he would end the practice of offering subsidized Vatican accommodation to senior curial officials, citing, quote, a context economic crisis such as the current one, which is particularly serious, which the Pope said highlighted, quote, the need for everyone to make an extraordinary sacrifice. Pause there. You remember that story from when uh, Cardinal Burke was punished, essentially, for speaking the truth about the events going on in the church. He was the first and, to my knowledge, only Cardinal with offices in Rome, an apartment in Rome, which really served as his apartment, or his apartment really served as his office because he has actual staff of people. He was the first one and the only one, to my knowledge, actually expected to pay for the, the actual 
market rate use of his apartment, which means he had to move. So going to be in Rome, but he can't afford the Vatican's steep rent. I'm going to check the live chat here. Um, David Wilson, wasn't there a court case in England about those property deals? Yes, I believe there was a court case in the UK about the, the uh, London condos. It made international news because, again, this is not the kind of stuff the Vatican should be involved in, and there are some pretty shady legal questions going on there. Um, let's see. Let's go back to this, though. As part of Francis's efforts to bring financial reforms to the Vatican, a curia-wide pay and hiring freeze has been in place for nearly a decade. <laughs> Though 2021's budget report shows salaries remain the curia's biggest single expense line at 135 9.5 million euros, so Francis instituted a senior-level pay cut for clerical employees, which did not touch lay staff. Now, I'm glad, one, that he didn't have it touch lay staff. We were talking laity who work there, do have families to feed and that kind of thing. But again, when you see that the single biggest line item is going to be budgets, your, your budget line item, large one, is related to manpower, that's normal. That is normal in any operation. The biggest expense the U.S. government has is the fact that it employs something like 2 million people or something, not counting the military. The any agency you go to, their biggest operating budget is going to be their stat, their their salaries. It's just as going to be anywhere you go, except maybe some highly specialized places that involve highly specialized equipment. The Vatican's number one expense being salaries is to be expected, and that's that's not unusual at all. But while the cuts have bitten deep for personnel, they have not closed the budget gap. Imperial sources quietly say that salary and hiring restrictions are unsustainable. Officials at several departments told the pillar that requiring more work from fewer people across departments is taking a toll on morale as well as productivity. The workload isn't just increasing for officials, one clerical staffer told the pillar. It's increasing for whole offices, too, especially after Vost Estes Lux Mundi. More and more cases and questions are coming into the departments about bad things the clergy have been alleged to do, Episcopal governance, liturgy, and a whole bunch of other staff. So for those who don't know, this is a document you're going to be hearing about from me on this channel a few times in the next few days. This was a document Francis issued several years ago. One of those actually not terrible things. Um, one of the things that document does is when there's been an, a priest accused of doing McCarrick kind of things or a bishop accused of sweeping it away, it requires them to uh, participate or to actually work with secular uh, legal system in the investigation. And it also says that regardless of the outcome of that investigation, the Vatican will do its own. It's not a bad thing. And that has obviously complicated the life of the people in the Roman Curia. But in this case, is that a bad thing? Let me know in the chat or in the comments if you think it's a bad thing. He says the worldwide church isn't shrinking. It's growing, and so is the work. But the offices aren't getting any bigger, just the piles on our desk. Officials in several Vatican departments also complained that while some departments are on a budgetary uh, severe diet, other curial departments seem comparably well-funded. It says a lot. One official close to the Secretary of State said that the Castro for communication costs nearly as much as the worldwide network of nunciatures. According to the Secretary for the Economy's 2022 mission budget statement, the Castro for communications has expenses budgeted at 38 million euros. The Castro for communications is where... Pastor Jimmy Martin of the Jesuit Church is actually a uh, consultor for. He has a formal role there. It's weird that their press office basically has that large of a budget. That is really weird. And that's where they should be making their first cuts. But out of there is going to be where Vatican News is operated and a few other official Vatican operations. But that it should be one of the first places they go, honestly. By comparison, expenses for the Secretary of State's embassy network were budgeted at $41 million. The entire dicastery for the evangelization was split, sit, slated to spend $21 million, and the dicastery for the doctrine of the faith had a budget of €2 million. Euros. See, Car Cardinal Fernandez operates on a small budget, but then again, I can't imagine why he would need a huge budget anyway. I think you get the idea, right? Then they give you this, this chart here of the actual, uh, how much money each one of these, you know, you know, how much money in millions of euros they spend on different things. You know, St. Mary Majors Basilica has a 3 million euro budget. Some interesting typos in this, but you get the idea, right? You, so communication has 38 million nunciatures, 41 nunciatures are the embassies, essentially the Vatican around the world. 
that's a s remarkably small budget for that many enunciatures. But you get the idea from this, how bad things are. And so we want to take a look here at a little bit of context. Um, David says in the chat, they could save money by making Francis and cyclical shorter and less frequent. That's a novel concept. Francis likes to have most of his encyclicals be book length, it seems like. So maybe taking a page from some of the preconciliar papes, popes and how they wrote typically much shorter encyclicals. Even Leo the Thirteenth was a prolific writer. His encyclicals are shorter by, which they're just much shorter than Francis's are. Um, I want to give you a couple con bits of context here. So here from the AP, this is something, this is from a, uh, earlier, uh, this is from last summer. The, the Associated Press reports that the Vatican has reported income boosts and charitable fund, even as donations dip following financial problems. So again, your with, withholding funds from the Vatican is having the desired uh, effect, at least the beginning of the desired effect. They are acknowledging that they're in financial pro trouble. But for that to have for that to have the desired desired outfit outcome, one you'll have to continue not donating to them. But the other thing is, this being resolved properly it relies entirely on Francis being followed by somebody better. Whether that's a Cardinal Zuppi, which is not going to be better, he'll just be he'll appear better. He is much more charismatic than Francis is, much more likable. But he agrees with Francis on everything. Or if it's going to be another moderate modernist if that doesn't change then we're going to be in this pattern for a long time financially but here we go from this you give you an idea the vatican on friday reported that a key charitable fund peter's pence doubled its income in 2022 to 107 million euros or more than 166 million dollars even as donations from the faithful dipped slightly following years of scandal over financial mismanagement at the holy see overall the peter's pence fund which finances the vatican bureaucracy and the pope's charitable projects around the world ended 2022 with 11.5 million euros in surplus compared to an 18.4 million euro deficit in 2021. That year, it only brought in 46.9 million euros in income, according to the financial statement. So what this means is you've got the big money donors in the church are stepping up to try to make up for this. We don't know who they are in particular, but I mean, you can take guesses at some high profile wealthy Catholics in the United States. They're probably helping, same in Germany and anywhere else really where where the elite have the kind of money needed to bail out the Vatican of this. Um, the disclosures follow years of scandal, in particular the Vatican Secretary of State's 350 million euro investment in a London real estate deal that is currently the subject of a criminal trial in the Vatican Tribunal. Prosecutors initially alleged that the money invested came from Peter's Pence Fund, but Vatican officials have since corrected prosecutors and said the money came from other sources. The scandal over the London real estate deal, plus broader financial problems and the effects of the 2020 issues, has led to a fall in donations. Contributions from private individual donors and dioceses, which dedicate a specific mass collection of the Peter's Pence Fund each June 29th, recorded a slight decrease in 2022. Once again, the U.S. is the biggest overall donor to Peter's Pence and uh, other big donors to Italy and Germany. No one is surprised by this. Now, I want to remind you, we're seeing, keep hearing reference to the events of 2020. The Vatican led the way. The Vatican, Vatican are why we had no sacraments unless you were going to an SSPX chapel or a set of a contest chapel. Otherwise, you didn't have sacraments for at least a few months in 2020. The Vatican went all in on this. And now they're paying the price for it. At least the financial material price for it. Yes, governments gave them some money at the time, but they went on all in at the time. But the, the pennies they got then will do nothing to alleviate the problems they're having now because a lot of people either never came back or they came back to mass once things were, were back to being able to go to mass, but they refused to financially support the Vatican. And I know that many of you in this live chat are actually, you know, in that boat here. That many of you refused. Um, David Wilson says, Peter's Pence is being misused for bailouts. No wonder contributions have dropped. Right, although they did report in 2023 that they had a better year than previously. But yeah, I can, can you imagine being a the kind of, a, the donor of means who 
is the kind approached by the Vatican to take care of this problem and not wanting to, because you see that this isn't being used for missionary work. In fact, you want to see, uh, but if you really want to see what, uh, just how bad that is, let's take a look here from the Wall Street Journal. Now, this came from uh, late 2019. With this headline, Vatican uses donations for the poor to plug its budget deficit. Only 10% of donations to Peter's Pence collection go to charitable works. Peter's Pence is sold to the faithful as supporting the mission work of the Holy Father. In this case would be spreading the gospel, feeding the poor, running Catholic hospitals. You get the idea. And only 10% of the donations to that go to that effect. It's normal for nonprofits. I, one of the things I trained for in grad school was to run, be able to run nonprofits. And it's it's normal that nonprofit organizations have overhead. But if you're getting much above 5% of your donations going to salaries and things, it means your fundraising is terrible or that your bureaucracy is bloated. Here we have 10% of the budget going to the actual advertised purpose of the donations. They're using this money to, to make up for the fact that since the Ted McCarrick problem broke, they have been having a hard time raising money. Again, look at the date, December 11th, 2019. In 2018, Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano issued his testimony, and then his follow-up couple of letters were directly about the Ted McCarrick problem, the Vatican's response to it, and all of that. It wasn't until about summer or fall of 2019 that the Vatican issued its own McCarrick report, which tried to place the entire blame for Ted McCarrick on Benedict XVI, John Paul II, and Carlo Maria Vigano. That was their response to it. And while certainly you can make a case for somebody who had been running in close in the highest, highest echelons of the Vatican circles going back to the 1980s, uh, John Paul II and Benedict the 16th should have known something about it and done something about it. If they had the power to, again, there's this, there is, there are those who remind people that the um, Jesuits have been in the hierarchy of the Vatican since the post-conciliar throughout the entire post-conciliar era. And were a co the cause of a lot of problems there. But those popes should have done something. That's almost a given. Almost nobody disagrees with that. But the Vatican threw them under the bus. And I'll tell you right now, if you when you throw like John Paul II under the bus, the typical Catholic in America loves John Paul II. So the response was, of course, to stop donating. To give you an idea of how hard they threw him under the bus, there were senior Vatican officials who expressed like regret that he was canonized. <laughs> okay. Now you, many of you may not agree with the canonization of John Paul II, and that's your prerogative. But I will tell you this much. If you if you as a, an official, a high-ranking official of the Catholic Church in the Roman Curia, basically say maybe we shouldn't have canonized somebody, what you've just done is undercut magisterial authority and papal infallibility. Because while the canonization process has never been formally declared to be an extension of papal infallibility, any theologian worth the name will tell you that it's an act of papal infallibility to canonize a saint. And so they threw John Paul II under the bus, said that maybe he shouldn't have been canonized over this stuff, which undercut Francis's authority and the authority of the papacy in general. And then suddenly the donations stopped coming in. I, even I can do the math on this one, which it may be this is why the Vatican Dicastery for Communications has as high a budget as it does, and maybe it needs a bigger budget to can get, to tell people the right talking points for Vatican officials at that time, whenever these kinds of stories break, to give the, to keep them all on the same page and not let them just run their mouths. Let's take a look here in the live chat. I saw saw some people here who are hardly ever in my live chat. So, good morning, Tony. Haven't seen you in a while. Uh, in the chat, uh, let's see who else. Um, some of the stuff I can't put on screen, but um, Robert Richard says none of the post conciliar popes should have been canonized. I am a believer that we should uh, keep the old rule of the 
of any pontiff who gets canon who, who is even up for canonization shouldn't even be made a blessing until they've been gone for 50 years at least minimum i actually would like to bring back the old standards for all the canon for all canonizations which is something like five miracles that are very rigorously studied and with the most hard line um standards for them and a devil's advocate and um that's just for like normal canonizations for popes it's even higher than that there's a re there's like the number of reasons why there hadn't been a pope canonized between pope saint pius v when he was canonized and pope saint pius x when he was canonized there was there's a reason that it took that long and that's why a lot of people don't trust the current system for it and i would read i would personally bring back the old mechanisms for it but also beginning with n not canonizing a pope who had recently been in office just to make sure that there's actually a the 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 actual following for theirs is, is organic and not something that is just manufactured. Morning, Jim. I have a video coming in a couple days here about some things going on in Australia. Um, so pay attention when that happens. And if you have info, there's I actually do a call for information on that story. So if you see that and you have information, please email me when it happens. Um, so, but good morning to you, Jim. Good morning to everybody showing up in the chat. And most people seem to actually agree with me that the 50 year rule always made sense. It does. <laughs> and this is why, because you want to make sure that canonizations are, we'll say inspired by the Holy ghost, as opposed to inspired by the popular will, because if anything, life in the 20th and 21st century has taught us that sometimes people get whipped up into supporting things and people they shouldn't fill in the blank, whatever public figures you want to on that. I'm thinking more celebrity culture, but you can think of way worse things in celebrity culture for, as examples. All right, folks. Um, let's see. Cell says the Baltimore Archdiocese is in bankruptcy. They told all parishes they're taking more of the collection. That happens, and they have that, apparently that authority to do so according to canon law. So, uh, yeah. Maria Foster. I see somebody. There's a new subscriber in the chat. Oh, well, well welcome, Martha. Glad to see you here. Um, but yeah, glad to see any glad to see how lively the chat is this morning. Um, how much how much is attendance down worldwide from 10 years ago for mass? Quite a bit, especially after mass was available again in like 2021 and 2022, depending where you were. We saw a dramatic decrease in any place you saw. You care to name the United States. We went down to something like 20 percent of Catholics attending mass regularly, which is appalling. Um, Jim Bowden says our Sydney Cardinal George Pell tried to fix Vatican finances. Right. This is why there's a story about a bishop in Australia that I'll be covering in a couple of days that I'm giving these much benefit of the doubt as I can because of Cardinal Pell. I cannot in good conscience trust anything coming out of uh, in, in, in the intersection of the church and the state there because of Card what happened to Cardinal Pell. That's unfortunate. Um, Immaculata says, I always tend to play devil's advocate and have to remember that I have to say that it's no longer a valid position. <laughs> For those who don't know what the devil's advocate did, in the canonization process, the devil's advocate's job was to dig up as much dirt as they could on the person being canonized and basically act as the lawyer against the canonization process. It was always a member of the Roman Curia who would do it and uh, afterwards, if the person was canonized, they go to confession and they just sort of lay low in the curia for a while because nobody liked doing that job. And it's understandable. I mean, bad mouthing a saint, right? Nobody wants to do that. But it was a much needed job. And the closest we've had to that since then was um, Christopher Hitchens was hired to be the equivalent of a devil's advocate in the canonization of Mother Teresa. I, he's not even a believer, so I don't know why they'd have him there. Because at least the faith keeps you grounded on making sure you're telling the truth. And while I'm not saying Christopher Hitchens didn't tell the truth as he understood it, there's nothing there. No like accountability of having to stand before our Lord and give an accounting of what you said there for someone who isn't a, doesn't believe. They don't. And Christopher Hitchens was notoriously not a fan of Mother Teresa. Um Cinderella says losing 80% is significant mass loss. Well, it's, it wasn't 80%. Remember, the um, mass attendance in the United States uh, has been down 
significantly. Back in the 1950s, it was 75% of, of professed Catholics went to mass on a regular basis. Now it's like 20%. It did go down and to go down significantly, but it's it, it, from like night from 2019 to 2022, but it didn't go down 80%. Um, all right, folks, if there's any further questions in the chat, this is your time, time to get them in. Do children's schools ever contribute much? Um, I, I do think their, their enrollment's down too. That's a lot of that's economic factors, but I don't know how that goes. Uh, if, how, if they're treated as a revenue driver for the diocese or not. Um, Art Stalker, St. Paul VI, too funny. I remember, did anybody, does anybody else remember Michael Matt's reaction to the canonization announcement of Paul VI? His reaction was just being totally flabbergasted because, uh, well, Paul VI wasn't, nobody followed, had a, there was no following for Paul VI. There was no movement among the laity. No expressed uh, people talked about how great he was. They, there were people who appreciated Humane Vitae, maybe a couple other things he did, but nobody, there wasn't the dedicated canonization following for Paul VI. He's an example of another one of these popes that uh, a lot of people say, let's let's wait. Now, they did wait close to 50 years for him, but the previous rigid standards just aren't there anymore. They were, those started getting changed in the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, yes, indeed, my technical issues were the uh, the big internet thing that happened a few days ago, and then just some consequences after of it afterwards that I fixed after that stream to the point where I redid that live stream the next day or that uh, a few hours later. No, nobody says John the twenty third was always most genuinely beloved than Paul the sixth. I believe it, but also being beloved isn't enough. Miracles or the, the earning the red crown; those are your typical ways of doing it. There are uh, good miracles associated with uh, Pope St. Pius X, for, exa for example, that led to his canonization. All right, folks. Uh, says, La Chiesa Viva, or Chiesa Viva tried to stop the Paul VI canonization. And you can go read those articles online if you want. They're all, they're available online, openly, easily found. Okay, folks. Thanks very much for tuning in today. If they're, um, I have a news video coming to you that is uh, going to be oddly well linked to this, I think, in a not in a topical way, but it's just thematically. So thanks for tuning in. And as always, pray for the church. I'm Anthony Stein. Ave Maria. <laughs>